is wealth and if you're able to eat healthily for me that is wealth yeah. and I think if you are able to look after yourself and you're able to share it with others that is just such a beautiful thing so for me I, I love being a little bit having my own food security mm -hmm. and I love being able to grow excess to share. As uh, we had the huge society problem back home with the economy crash that started in 2009. So the needs of uh, renew myself and find a better solution for me, for the next generation, for the earth. I chose to do a PGC because I wanted to learn something different. I really wanted to learn something different. I was from a, from a traditional school, you know, and, um, and with the life I was having, I wasn't that happy. So I wanted to be sustainable, if it's the word, yeah, I wanted to be sustainable. Uh, so one of my friends had noticed that I was getting into my little veggie patch at my house and got me a magazine and in the magazine was information about the PDC and that's how I got it, found out about it and then the more I researched about it on the internet and found out about it I decided that this was the way to go and there was a lot of value in what I could learn at the PDC so I just took the opportunity and, and came and it's been great. Wise people will grab it from here and use it when it's out there we'll do it tomorrow so access is very important whether things get done or don't get done and um, my mulch comes from whenever I mow or whippersnip I harvest it so this is the spillway of the major food forest swale the one that brought the nutrient back into the system and this is where it spills here and when we're getting quite wet all water sort of catches there and spills through here as well. So it gets a little bit wet through here. And then 
goes down through the whole food forest area. We need more carbohydrates. That part of the garden there, it's a different sort of section than the top section. So it's, it's what I call my carbohydrate area. So there's lots of spuds being put in there this year, that the, the one above the swale. And I'm realizing I need more carbohydrates. And so this area here, I, I said, okay, well, let's get this one happening in here. And it hasn't gone very well because this time of the year, sweet potatoes really suppress, it's too cold. But we've planted a sweet potato in this. How do I prepare this? Too much manure coming, I could have just left it in a pile and created a festering mess. I've come in here and spread wheelbarrow loads without even sheet mulching or anything, just on top of the grass, what we mowed yesterday, that very similar. And just, this has all been cow manure. There was some topsoil put in some spots, but it was mostly cow manure. And I've just left it and it turned a lot quicker than I expected. What they've mainly done is eradicated the grass seed. So I hardly have any grass come up. There'll be some clumps of solid grass, clumpy stuff like these ones here, really tough, that I'll dig out once I've moved it before I plant, just so that they don't come back. And then I just keep coming back and just checking that there's not so much grass growing. What that's all about, grass is bacterial based and uh, trees are fungal based. So whatever I do chop and drop now in that section there is fungal based. If it's grass, it'd be bacterial based. So we're actually creating a natural environment for the tree. It's joyful. You get to see the abundance of how things are grown. I think all chefs should come and do that to see where their produce actually comes from, how it's grown, um, when it's plentiful in the garden. That's the time to to make pastes and um, yeah, it's it's definitely great. It really, yeah, starts with when you wake up in the morning to what you want to have to drink with your herbal teas. Pretty much I try to keep the vitamins in the, in the plant so I harvest them just before I, which we have been doing before our course, so they're picked, um, you know, just before lunch and, uh, and cooked to try and keep the seasonal tastiness and the vitamins in the greens that we've been using in the garden. We've already started to implement some changes but with what we've, because my husband's already done the course, we're both going to be able to go home and work at implementing the changes that we've learnt in the course, start making our own soil, um, making sure our, you know, the food that we're growing is, is organic, we know where it's come from, um, we know how to set up our livestock so it's actually more productive for us within, within our permaculture design property. The first thing I will do after that course is grow food grow my own food. 
it would be the first thing. Seems like the the right thing to do for for me and my my friends and family and I guess uh, the world as a whole. It seems like the the right thing to do to take responsibility for your place on the earth. <laughs>
and the water just flows out from the bottom mm -hmm. and then goes out to the garden. Yep. So this actually separates all the food, yep. but more than just separating, yep. it also breaks the food down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so about once every six months, mm -hmm. I'll actually dig this soil out mm -hmm. and throw it into the garden. So we started with a composting toilet because one of the benefits of a composting toilet is that it's very easy to install, very quick, um, and very uh, mobile. You can move it around. So we thought, well, let's go with a composting toilet. It's you know, sound, in, ec ecologically, we'll get material for the garden from it, but also we could, make, we could set up a toilet in a day and have something ready to go. So um, this system was an off-the-shelf system from an Australian Queensland company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a batching system, basically it's a bucket with a drain at the bottom of it and a ventilation fan. Mm -hmm. um, you fill the bucket and once the bucket is full, you pull the bucket out and you put it off to one side and it composts. I really wanted to build. I've always wanted to. I wanted to explore that whole process. And as a result of doing it, I've ended up becoming a builder, really. Um, not, a, not that I'm a qualified builder, but I've ended up, it's becoming my income now. I, I actually, you know, people can see that I can build. They've seen the process, and so now they ask me to come and build for them. And so that's, for me personally, where I, I'm heading. With the idea of, of trying to focus on, on a, a building and sustain, a sustainable building and sustainable architecture. Though I'm not a purist by any means, I'll, I, you know, you've got to always weigh up if you're doing something for someone else that it's their money. And sometimes doing things um, with a pure eco-focus is not really cost effective. Uh, when I first came here there was uh, a lot of lantana which is uh, invasive weed on the north coast and um, it had a good sunny aspect but it was quite a steep uh, slope to work with so initially I just camped here for uh, a couple of months and uh, watched uh, the angle of the sun and uh, where the weather came from and uh, the wind ex and uh, so on and from there uh, I worked out where it would be best to uh, to put a house and uh, also uh, looked at where it was the best sun aspect for a vegetable garden and uh, an orchard. I have three panels, it's uh, 320 watts altogether, mm -hmm. uh, no, 340 watts, so uh, yeah it's a small system but uh, it's enough uh, to run a washing machine uh, provided the day is sunny and with a large battery bank I have uh, 450 hours of battery uh, so that means that uh, there's plenty of reserve there for cloudy weather. Everything is done by hand. I have used some power tools, of course, uh, chainsaw and, and power drill and so on. But uh, yeah, all the, the earthworks here I've done by hand. The footings for the house and so on. Okay. This house uh, runs off uh, a spring line, uh, capturing spring water up in the forest. Uh, water is a precious resource, so uh, we want to make as best use of it as possible. And one way to do that is to recycle all the grey water and waste water onto the vegetable garden or onto the orchard. Uh, so uh, the system is gravity fed, meaning that uh, the water comes into the house from a high point, from a header tank, and then is used in the house and from there is disposed of through the plumbing into a grey water system, which is two tanks that I use then to uh, store the wastewater for use on the garden. Here as much uh, as I can I've tried to use uh, the natural materials that are found in the environment here uh, and also I've used a lot of uh, recycled uh, hardwoods from uh, uh, taken down houses on here around the north coast that have been sold as second hand timber. Yeah I think the main thing uh, you know that I felt coming to this site was to build as low impact as possible here and to use as much of the local natural materials here on, on and around the site that I could 
with minimal impact to the surrounding forest and the environment. Property is a lot of um, work and, you know, unless you're prepared for it or unless you've got money to pay for someone else to do it for you, mm -hmm. it can be a bit of a shock and some people, and we, I know people not just in community here but outside of Starlight in, in just the general area here who have bit off more than they can chew, either financially, mm -hmm. they've put too much money down or, or just physically they can't keep up with the amount of work and it falls apart and, it's, and that can be quite um, distressing when that happens. So. Uh, generally, I would recommend that if anybody's interested in living on property that they rent for a bit first and see what it's like. Um, not to say that you can't leave the city and say live in, in a, a small town or something like that. There are, there are a lot of options there. But on property like this, you, you've got to be able to um, uh, have the stamina or the resources to take it on. The community is about um, sustainability as well as, uh, as general spiritual uh, awareness and, and modeling a sustainable way of living. So that's about fundamentally caring for, for the earth and for, for humanity. I've been looking for, for community for, uh, for many years, for at least 10 years, without finding something that suited me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I found this uh, group of people who I believed in. And it was that group of people that ended up uh, starting Bilbanya. So it started as an idea about two years before that. Mm -hmm. And um, we we got together a whole heap of people and we talked about, well, what is it that we would create? If we could create anything at all, what would we create? 
and we came up with a list of values and I, it, what, what it is that we want to do. And um, over the course of the next two years, you know, we, we brought those back down to, well, what does the land need to have in order to support that vision? And we finally found the ideal piece of land for us and, and um, it would, took us about six months to finance and to, to buy it. And then we moved in just before Christmas in 2008. It's wonderful. Like there's, um, there's nothing like community living. That is not to say that it is the best way of living because that's, that's individual, personal choice. Um, and different communities suit different people. Uh, it's uh, a, a peaceful and, uh, and quiet place. It's in very rich uh, nature. And being an intentional community with a shared intention of uh, promoting sustainability and living with uh, a spiritual awareness and a, a care and, and consideration for, for each other. They're things I, I value a lot and that I find in, in general in, in mainstream society, um, they're missing. do we do when we think things should be done in different ways? We have a, a lot of awareness around that. So we have um, decision-making processes, uh, we have consensus decision-making and um, a number of other things we do to, to help us with that. Mm -hmm. um, and that is very important in, in community. I don't think communities that don't have an awareness and some policies and procedures around those things will succeed. Um, they'll end up tearing each other's head off. <laughs> well, look, we we were really lucky in the in in the people who were drawn to be here. Um, so when we first started, you know, we had such a range of skills. We had um, Rose who has run. Uh, restaurants before and, and done a lot of catering. Uh, we have a builder, we have an electrical engineer, uh, Chris has done community development, we have someone who specialises in communications, uh, you know I've got a uh, background in law. So many different skills all adding to each other and uh, so what's, what's been uh, what's been able to happen is people have been able to bring their skills to the table and contribute that, help others to learn those skills or to, to, to get some of those skills. So we all get a little bit of, ah, oh, I see now, you know, <laughs> and be able to build uh, Belbanya up in a very holistic sense, you know, so, so making sure that we have in place systems that support what we want to do, financial systems that are uh, sustaining and support what we want to do, and the physical aspects. and. Um, so it's, it's worked really well in enabling people to follow what they're passionate about. One of the really valuable things we have here at Belbanya mm -hmm. is this flow of, of people coming through. Mm. I mentioned before this, this notion of our humanity and, and how we see each other. Yeah. It is a blessing having 
people from all these different cultures with different backgrounds, different dreams and, and so on, come through and, and share their, their knowledge and their enthusiasm. And sometimes maybe just resting at Bilbonia and rejuvenating or you know, re-energizing. Yeah, volunteers bring a fantastic range of skills and enthusiasm and I sort of kind of think of them like bees going around pollinating plants because whilst we're sort of here at Belbunya doing our thing, we've got a whole lot of volunteers who are going visiting all kinds of different communities and coming here and sharing with us about what they've learnt in these other communities and places, which is which is great. And then they go off and they share about us with other places and volunteers come here who've met some of the volunteers who've been here before, you know, which is really, really nice, really good for us. えっと、ガーデニングや農業をやらせてもらってます。エコビレッジとかコミュニティとか um, I'm a woofer here right now at Zaytuna Farm, also known as the Permaculture Research Institute of Australia. As a woofer, I get up in the morning and I help out with morning chores and tasks. Uh, the gardens are actually mostly run by the woofers here. Uh, they actually have, I think, five or six woofers right now on site. It's been really liberating coming here and, and becoming a part of that production of food and being a part of, of, of a community that works together to produce their food. And this is where we put woofers to come and stay. Yeah. Oh, you drew some stuff? What is it? And living in, in community is uh, challenging. It will challenge everybody. But on the other hand, for me, that is, is a choice where I see it as, as an opportunity to, to grow. Just like in a relationship or in a family, whenever you try to live with others, there are challenges. Community is no different. If one person has a passion for something that's about improving the world, then that will rub off on other people. People will participate in it initially, not necessarily because they may have an interest in it, but out of respect and care for that other person because they're in a relationship with that person. And gradually they'll get infused with an understanding of whatever that issue is. It might be refugees or recycling or whatever and their interest will grow because they're a human being, you know, in that particular issue and they'll, they'll start becoming more active in it. So we eat together uh, every night, you know, we, we share a, a lot of community space, we share a workload, we share gardens, we share visioning, uh, we share processes. I think when communities functioning effectively, people can really grow that you know and it's not necessarily a community like this you know it might be a community in the suburbs where people are doing neighborhood community you know there's a, so many different ways of of making community happen but i think human beings 
we've evolved to live in community, you know, to live with other people in some kind of way and to be in relationships. And, and in our society, the way we're doing it today with governments sort of helping us not to need to negotiate anything in our relationships with other people because we've got all these rules. If we just follow the rules, we don't need to negotiate anything. That takes us away from building deeper relationships potentially with people. And it's generally about being being present to to life and and the situation you're you're in, so that you can uh, feel its its life and and vibrancy. So it's it's something that connects to to the joy of life. can do it. You've got this resource, that resource, it's all here. You just got to put it all together. I think we need to take those skills wherever we can because every country needs them. There are a few obviously that are doing really good things but there's those bigger countries that have a lot of pull that are just not working in a sustainable way and there's just too big output. So if we can take what we've learned and spread it around the world more then I think everyone will be better off and we all might be here a little bit longer. We all want to to be safe. We all uh, want to express uh, love and, and feel loved. And we all want to make a, a contribution to to this world. I hope to to live my life as, as peacefully as I can and respect my place on the earth and, and hopefully the rest of the world can live that way too. So you gotta really ask, what are we sustaining? I'd love for one day us to actually increase topsoils in areas that we live in. Because it seems like, you know, wherever we go, biodiversity decreases and soils are lost. And I think that by learning how to make our own soil and care for the soil, we, we will be giving that back. Our food ultimately comes from the soil. If you trace it back, it's not going back to grass because grass goes back to soil. So. My vision is that humans can live within their environments as a part of it, not apart from it. And they can increase its health and biodiversity. You have to start with, uh, with yourself. Just like it's, it's said about uh, peace, you know, you can't create peace in, in the world unless you have peace within yourself. Well, look, I would just say uh, get some friends together and uh, look at uh, moving on to some land, just go and do it. You know, there's a big world out there still and uh, with everyone wanting to live in the cities for whatever reasons, money-wise, material-wise and so on, that uh, can leave room for people who are very serious to uh, live closer to nature, to get out there and uh, see what they can do. So I would just say go and do it. Don't wait. I think, you know, if there's a whole whole range of ways that people can can live their lives and living in a community like this is just one of a plethora of possibilities and there's heaps of other ways of building community. I think people need to be building community and sharing what they really value and giving life to those values and, and really connecting with their humanity and and out of that, yeah a better world emerges. Hey 